Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories, which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. I have a fantastic story today that you're absolutely going to love and it comes from Tessa in rural Tennessee and she has called it Bigfoot Stole My Baby or Bigfoot Stole the Baby, sorry, correction. She writes, Dear Sarah, I do want to stress that I really need to remain anonymous and if that was not a promise on your part, I would most certainly not tell my story to either you or your listeners. I would also prefer to leave dates, places and names out of the equation for my own personal protection, if you do not mind. This is partly because as a young girl of 15 years old, all that time ago, perhaps I did not behave as responsibly as I should have around the time that Bigfoot took the baby. My sister Peggy was 18 years old when she had a baby out of wedlock. She never told the father about the impending pregnancy. You, sh you see, she had had a fleeting one night stand with him and she did not want him to be involved in the raising of her child. Peggy was an amazing mother and there was nothing that she would not do for her little Kirsty. She even took up a job as a nurse working night shifts so that she could give the best possible standard of living to her growing sprog. Peggy and I grew up with my grandmother, who took care of us and raised us from when we were knee-high to a grasshopper. All we knew about my mother was that she had suffered from substance abuse, drug addiction and drug addiction, and so the authorities had entrusted my grandmother to the legal guardianship of both of us. Rumours abounded around our town that my mother had become a down-and-out, or vagrant, so to speak. Our gran was an amazing woman, but she was hard of hearing and also suffered from really bad arthritis, which really meant she did struggle getting around, and so most of the household duties, including the babysitting, were left to me. I did not mind, of course, but being a young 15-year-old girl at the time, I did have my mind on other matters, so to speak. I was seeing a boy two years older than myself who lived in the town, he was very clever, always getting the highest grades at school to boot. To school, he was always getting the highest grades at school. To boot, he was also extremely handsome, and most of my friends were very jealous of my amazing relationship with him. In those days, we were pretty much inseparable. My boyfriend Jason was also a keen hunter of moose, and even though he had not been shooting for long, he did have a reputation of being an amazing shot. Men twice his age were amazed by how brilliant a hunter he really was. I loved living in Tennessee countryside. It was a beautiful life as far as I was concerned. And I really loved the great outdoors. Jason loved helping my grandmother and he did all kinds of odd jobs around the house and chopped firewood for those long drawn out cold nights we get in this part of the world. 
The woods that surrounded our home were magical because they were abundant with wildlife and animals of every kind. Jason and I would take long walks in the forest, sometimes accompanied by our two bulldogs, Jesse and Bella. One day, Jason suggested that we go for a picnic in the woods, and as I was on babysitting duty, he suggested that we could take Kirsty with us in a pram, as well as our two bulldogs. It seemed like a great idea, but I insisted on finishing the washing up first for my grandmother, and then I packed us an amazing picnic lunch. I filled up the Tupperware lunch tin, tin with ham and tomato sandwiches, beef jerky and chocolate nut brownies. And let's not forget the Coca-Cola. For Jason, no meal was the same without that fizzy sweet soda. Then off we went into the woods to have a spectacular picnic lunch. It was a magnificent sunny day. And as we approached the woods, we were surprised to find that all was unusually quiet and still. There were no animals darting past us like they usually would, like the odd deer or even rabbit. Everything was extremely silent and rather uncomfortable to say the least. Worse still, both of my build bulldogs did not want to venture into the woods at all and literally had to be dragged in and persuaded in by Jason. If you know what, if you know what bulldogs are like at all, they are stubborn creatures and it is very difficult to persuade them to do something if they're dead set against it. I had never seen my dogs behave like this on a walk. They nearly always loved their trips to the woods, but today was different and I could hear that both of my beloved pets were far from happy. They had never behaved like this before, I explained to Jason. Not to worry, laughed Jason. Dogs have a good sense of smell. They might have smelt something they didn't like. Like what, I asked. Dunno, said Jason. Anything, I suppose. Dogs can be sensitive, you know. Kirsty was such a beautiful baby who never cried like some babies do. She normally gurgled with laughter and was always smiling. But on this occasion, she started to cry and cry and cry. I took her out of the pram to comfort her and I started her bobbing up her up and down as I held her in my arms. That seemed to do the trick. Before long, she stopped crying and we continued on our way into the woods. We finally found a perfect spot for our picnic where there was a rocky verge with a, a small little stream running on the side. The large expanse of smooth rocks was so lovely and warm and so enticing that Jason and I decided to sunbathe on them. It was not long before we both fell into a deep sleep. I awoke to find both of my bull bulldogs growling fiercely with their ears down and their tails between their legs. They both looked fearful. I looked up and woke jo Jason up, shaking him violently. The dogs really are being weird, I urged him. Something doesn't feel right. I think we need to leave. The dogs are sensing something. Jason was feeling it too, and so hastily we retreated out of the forest. And it was only as we were leaving that I noticed that little Kirsty was not in her pram anymore. She had gone. I cried out in horror. Where is Kirsten? Where is Kirsten? She's not here. She's not here. We left her in the pram when we were sleeping, didn't we? Jason nodded. We did. Well, where is she then? Jason, she's gone. What am I going to do? Peggy is going to kill me, I cried. Calm down, urged Jason. There has to be some rational explanation for this, because a baby just does not disappear like this. Let's go back and see if she's by the picnic spot. Maybe you put her down on the ground and not back in the pram. Who knows? Supposing... Supposing something dreadful has happened to her, I cried. I did not know what was going through my head. All I knew is that my focus was to get back my beautiful niece now as soon as we could. We rushed to our picnic spot as quickly as we could, but there was no sign of Kirsty anywhere. She was well and truly gone, and I was devastated. I was afraid and overwhelmed all rolled into one. What are we going to do? I cried. It's all my fault. 
I should not have gone to sleep like that. How could I do that? Something took her while we were asleep. I know, I said. Or someone, corrected Jason. Maybe a child napper followed us in, into the forest. Or maybe a wild animal took the baby, I suggested. We considered all the possibilities. And then we heard it. The sound of a baby crying. And it wasn't too far off. It's Kirsty, I cried out in relief. She's somewhere here. I know it. Can you hear her? We tied the bulldogs to a tree, left the empty pram at the clearing, and then we tiptoed towards the area that we could hear the crying from. The crying got louder and louder, and we realized that we were getting closer and closer to where Kirsty was. We hid behind the huge trunk of a red cedar tree and peeked around the corner to see who the kidnapper was who had taken our little Kirsty, And there she was. I knew she was a she because she had placed little Kirsty on the nipple of one of her full dangling breasts. At first the baby seemed resistant to this alien kind of flesh. You see, she had been raised on formula and so was not used to a mother's breast milk, let alone a creature like this. After a while she stopped crying as she drank the milk from this huge creature's breast, gurgling with delight. If this creature was nursing, I thought, where is her real baby? And then it occurred to me, maybe her real baby had died. But what on earth, I thought, what on earth is this creature? This creature was enormous, yet she was underweight for someone, for something as large as she was. She was not standing, but squatting on the floor with Kirsty in her arms, and she was chattering to the baby as if trying to soothe it. Kirsty gurgled with delight. She was enjoying the attention of this terrifying looking beast. I was sick to my stomach, and my insides were cheer churning with sheer horror of the situation. The creature was covered with dark auburn hair, and the face was cone shaped and the body proportions were mammoth in size. The arms rarely drew my attention because they were exceptionally long, but I will say this for her. She appeared to be extremely gentle with Kirsty. As I had grown to suspect, she was a mother who had lost her baby, and I did feel a smouldering sense of sympathy for her. Yet this creature should never have taken poor little Kirsty. It was not right, I thought angrily. Even though I was filled with terror and horror, as well as awe, 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 all at the same time, with what I was witnessing, I just knew we had to get the baby away from this creature. But how? I beckoned to Jason, and he followed me away from the tree to an area where I felt I could talk to him without being overheard by the creature. Luckily our stealth had paid off, and she had not noticed us creeping away from her. But that may have been because she was so wrapped up in her mothering instinct looking after baby Kirsty. She's clearly not going to hurt Kirsty, I said. You can see she's smitten by her. We just have to get Kirsty away from her. What shall we do? Did you see how emaciated she is? I asked. Her bones were sticking out of her flesh like a starving dog. Maybe we should put our picnic lunch near enough to her so that it lures her to the food. I suspect she's starving for some reason, although I don't know why. There's so much wildlife out here. Maybe she's sad about her baby's death. And maybe she lost weight as a result. I considered that thought. That was a plausible explanation, I thought. We need to kill her, said Jason, picking up his large rifle. I'm a good shot, he said. I'll take her out in a second. She will not feel a thing, I promise. I was horrified by Jason's suggestion. I do not mind warning shots, I said. If they're needed, of course, and only if they're needed. But did you not see her? The poor thing was so desperate to be a mother. You could see that a mile off. I do not want to kill her unless you have to. Promise me that you will not hurt her unless things start to get dangerous for us. 
I still think we should take her out, he insisted. This is a dangerous creature that we are dealing with. You realise this thing could kill us in an instant if it wanted to. Look, I said, let's just try this food thing. You never know, it may just work. A uh, Jason was very reluctant, but I opened up the Tupperware containers and told him to go and get the pram and the dogs while I prepared the food trap. I put the Coca-Cola and all the delicious food that we had brought as close as I could to where the creature was sitting and nursing Kirsty. I then hid behind the tree and watched her. She sniffed the air curiously, and I think she could smell the food. She suddenly put down Kirsty, got on all fours, and literally ran to where the food was. I could hear her making sounds that you hear when a ravenous animal is suddenly tucking into a meal. I rushed over to the area where she had put Kirsty down, and I beckoned to Jason, who was now with the dogs, and we just ran out of that forest as fast as we could, without looking behind us. A while later, in the distance, we could hear the howls of a creature, clearly in great distress. The poor thing sounded so desperate, like a mother grieving the loss of a dead baby, and now the loss of Kirsty, who was never hers in the first place. As you can imagine, I never ever told my sister about what had happened with her baby. I knew if I had, she would never have trusted me with her child again. Frankly, I would not have blamed her. But would she have believed my story anyway? Somehow I doubted it. You and your listeners may think that I never ventured near those woods again. But that is where you're wrong. I felt so very sorry for the creature that I persuaded jo Jason to let me go into the woods and leave parcels of food from her, for her from time to time. He thought it was a terrible idea, but only agreed to it because he did not want me to go into the woods on my own behind his back without any am ammunition in tow. We did leave parcels for the creature on a regular basis, and a few years went by, and one day when we both went into the forest, we saw the creature again although luckily she did not see us. I'm almost certain it was her, and this time she had gained weight and looked as if she weighed 700 pounds. She looked magnificent, and the best thing of all was that she was carrying a baby Sasquatch in her arms. I went home feeling so very happy, and over the years I continued to leave her food until we both moved away from Tennessee. I do think of that Sasquatch often because I now know that what I saw was indeed a Bigfoot. And I wonder if she is still alive today or where her little sprog is. I really related to her somehow, even though she was so dangerous. I hope you and your viewers enjoyed my story. What a fantastic story. I enjoyed that story so much and I hope everybody else listening did too. I've got a lovely camping experience of a Bigfoot encounter for you. So let's get started. I think you're really going to enjoy this story. Dear Sarah and all your listeners, I'm writing to tell you about my Bigfoot encounter that happened to me on the 7th of June, 2010. I was 11 years old at the time and one of my favorite things to do was to go camping. I had a best friend at the time called Nathan and we would spend countless hours together. The trouble was that Nathan was so much braver than I was and despite the fact that I was an outdoorsy sort of person, I never ventured into the woods on my own. There were all kinds of speculation about the woods that surrounded our property. We had heard horrifying stories about supernatural experiences, ghostly encounters and weird animal noises. I have to admit the woods scared me. From time to time I had heard strange sounds emanating from the woods that we could not explain, like the sounds of a woman screaming as if she was in the throes of being murdered. There had also been times we'd heard the most terrifying roars, but most of the time, however, we would hear the normal sounds of the night, like coyotes and owls, etc., etc. My father was a brilliant hunter, and he went into the woods very frequently to hunt squirrel, rabbit, and the occasional deer. He often told us that he sometimes felt he was being watched and even stalked, but he said he was certain it was his imagination. I was not so sure. One time my father came back from a hunt and swore he had seen a woman just vanish in front of him. You saw a ghost, I said with excitement. What did she look like? 
My father was the most sceptical person I'd ever known. So the day he saw his ghostly encounter literally shifted his whole perception of reality, and I could see that he was struggling with what he'd seen. He told me that the ghostly woman was wearing jeans and a bright pink t-shirt, and looked as real as you and I, and he was about to say hello to her, and then she suddenly just vanished before his very eyes. The story really creeped me out, and so after that encounter I really did not fancy going into the woods unless I went rabbing, rabbit hunting with my dad because I felt safe with an adult. One day Nathan begged me to go camping in the woods with him. Usually when I camped I would set up shop just outside our wooden cabin so, did, so that if things got scary I could always rush indoors to the safety of mum and dad. However, on this occasion I couldn't let Nathan down. He looked so excited about the prospect of camping in the woods, and it was his 12th birthday, after all, so I just had to be game for it, as reluctant as I was. My parents were fine about me camping in the woods as long as I had a mobile phone with me and a hunting rifle with me at all times. Nathan and I filled up our backpacks with everything we would need, including a tent for two, sleeping bags, flashlights, fire starters, a portable gas hob, a pot for boiling water, and of course the essentials like hot dogs, donuts, trailer mix, hot chocolate, marshmallows and birthday cake. Suddenly, despite my reservations about the woods, I could feel faint stirrings of growing excitement. We would be all on our own and that prospect gave me a great feeling. Perhaps I was finally getting over my fear of the woods, I thought. It was a beautiful warm spring day when we set up camp very close to the lovely creek. We immediately made a fire and made some hot chocolates over the portable some hot chocolate over the portable gas hob. We had seen a few rabbits darting around and the odd squirrel retreating up a tree. It felt great to be out in nature, I thought. Suddenly we heard a rustle and it sounded like two people coming towards us. It was a woman and a man, and they both also had backpacks on their back, so they were clearly intending to come camping. Hi guys, said the young lady who was quite pretty, I thought. This is my friend Kirk, she said, and my name is Eloise. I see you've set up camp here. How nice. That's right, I said. We're setting up camp also. We will try to go further down the creek so we're not in your way, but don't get freaked out if you hear us during the night. I'm sure you won't be that noisy, I said. Well, I hope not, she said. It really depends on what tonight throws at us. We're paranormal investigators, you see. Wow, I said. So you believe in ghosts? Of course, she said, or I wouldn't be staying in the woods tonight, would I? What exactly are you researching? asked Nathan curiously. Well, there's been quite a few sightings of the young girl that was murdered in these woods about ten years ago. The poor girl, she lived around here, you know, and her dog went missing and so she came in the woods to find him. I gather the thing he loved chasing rabbits and it was hard to keep him away from the woods. Anyway, the poor girl never returned home and was later found in the woods with her head completely decapitated. Of course, the dog turned up and he was fine. Oh, sorry, she said, looking at my horrified face. I really did not mean to scare you. No, I said, please go on about the girl, I mean. Did they ever find her? I mean, did they find her killer? That's a bizarre thing, she said. It was the way that she died that raised more questions than answers. Even the medical examiner said that it looked as if her head had been plucked off her neck like a grape from a vine. That's how neat the decapitation was. Could it have been a bear? The medical examiner said, it, said that the death was undetermined because she said it definitely wasn't a bear nor a wild cat, but it's inconclusive whether it was a human or not. The head was removed with perfect precision, but not with a knife or machete or anything like that. Unlikely to be human, I said. Well, we will never know. There's a lot of unexplainable things that go on in the woods in North America. Believe me, I've heard stories that would make your heckles rise. Are you hoping for a sighting of the girl ghost? Nathan asked. Oh, we want a sighting, but we also have our equipment, like our tape recorders, EVP monitors, temperature gauges, and of course our ghost box. We're hoping she may come through. Why are you doing the investigation? I asked. It's for the parents, she told me. They want answers. They believe her boyfriend at the time might have done her in. I gather she wanted to end things with him, and they think he's behind her gruesome murder. At that moment, I was reminded of my father's ghostly encounter. Was she wearing a pink t-shirt and jeans, I asked. Eloise looked at me in shock, and her face went as white as a sheet. 
How do you know what she was wearing? she asked. I explained that my father believed he'd seen a ghost wearing a pink t-shirt and jeans in the woods not too long ago. Wow, said Eloise. That's ten sightings of her in these woods over ten years. Extraordinary. Anyway, guys, she said, we better get up, set up camp for tonight's investigation. If you need anything, we're a little way down the creek. Wow, I said to Nathan when they were out of earshot. Wait until I tell my dad about this. It's going to freak him out because it'll affirm he really did see the ghost of the girl in the woods. Finally, the sun set, and after roasting marshmallows over an open fire, we decided to turn in for the night. It was about two o'clock in the morning that I woke up to the sound of footsteps outside our tent. I immediately thought it might be Eloise and Kirk doing their investigation. I climbed out of the tent eagerly. I wanted to ask them how the investigation was going, and whether the ghost girl had come through or not. But it was not the investigators I saw, but the most humongous creature that I have ever seen. In that moment I wet my pants, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I just stood there, staring at the creature, unable to shift my gaze from his menacing eyes that were glowing a bright red colour. I could see him clearly because there was ample moonlight, and he was a fearsome predator. If you think a lion is scary, this creature was a thousand times worse, and I just knew he was going to kill me. I did not think it, I just knew it, without a shadow of a doubt. You would think I would run away as fast as I could, like any no new normal human being would, but I just stood there, frozen to the spot, simply unable to move. My legs felt as if they weighed a thousand tons, almost as if my whole body had become rock hard like dried cement. That is how impossible it was for me to move. The creature was so black he was almost navy blue. That's how dark he was. And his hair was thick and tangled, almost like he had dreadlocks. His face was huge and his body was massive in both girth and width. He was about ten foot tall, a thousand pounds, with strapping legs that looked like massive tree trunks. The creature let out the most terrible roar that even our tent trembled from the vibration. And he screamed, sounding just like a woman being murdered, the sound that I sometimes heard coming from the woods. Suddenly I heard gunshots as several rounds were fired in his direction. In that second, the creature literally jumped five foot in the air and in two strides he was gone. I turned around and saw Kirk putting down his firearm. What the heck was that? he asked. I've never seen anything like that before. It's a big thought, I think, said Lu Eloise. It couldn't have been anything else. Are you all right? she asked me. I tried to hold back the tears, but I couldn't. Nathan suddenly came out of the tent, clutching my father's rifle, and tears were also pouring down his face. I knew he was lucky not to have seen the creature, but just hearing him had filled him with terror. Finally, I looked at Eloise and said, I think we found the killer of the young girl. It must have been that Bigfoot, I said. Eloise looked at Kirk and they both nodded. I'm in no doubt, she said. It makes perfect sense now. The parents were never told that we suspect Bigfoot killed their daughter because Eloise believed that would traumatize them even more. But she did tell them that she believed it was not the boyfriend that was responsible for their daughter's unexplainable death. And that seemed to give them some closure. All these years later, I still enjoy camping, but I've never been back into those woods. There have also been no more sightings of the ghost girl, so maybe she also has had some kind of closure. I hope you enjoyed my encounter. Thank you for that lovely story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I am from Pike County in Illinois and my name is Sonia. I live here in a gorgeous country home overlooking a magnificent lake and a wooded area that goes back for many miles. I'm a married woman of 32 years old and I have a three-year-old daughter called Dottie. My encounter with the Bigfoot happened on the most unlikely day of all days because everything that could go wrong from the moment I got up to the time that I went to bed did go wrong. I'm talking about the kind of day that we do not want to remember and really wish to forget. In my case, that is not likely to happen as this particular day is the day that I saw Bigfoot and so it will permanently be engraved on my memory for a lifetime. 
I had invited a couple of friends over for lunch. I had just returned from a weekend in Las Vegas and I wanted to fill them in on all the details about my exciting adventure. All the casinos I went to, all the shows I watched. I was bursting to tell them everything. Little did I know that that day would offer some interesting entertainment all of its own that would f far outdo my Las Vegas experience. I had just started to prepare lunch when the water pipe from my kitchen sink burst and there was water everywhere. I called out a plumber and he managed to fix the broken pipe, but the kitchen looked like a tsunami had hit it. There was water everywhere and it was a massive task to clean up. Let's not kid. I see you have a very large bear out there, the plumber commented in a jovial voice. I must say I've not seen one so large before. He's a hefty fellow, he is. Oh, I said, we do not get too many of those on our property. I ushered him out of the kitchen eagerly for him because I was eager for him to leave. I was not really going to listen to his idle chatter. I had so much to do and it was nearly lunchtime. I needed to get on with the lunch before my guests arrived. What was I going to prepare? Oh yes, I was making a hot pasta dish with chicken strips and salad. Just as I was chopping the mushrooms, I heard my golden retriever make that gargling noise from his throat that tells you at once that he's about to throw up and regurgitate his breakfast. Oh no, I said, rushing to his side to push him out of the door. Please no, not on my clean kitchen floor. But it was too late. Piles of vomit floated across the floor in islands of beige puke. It was truly disgusting and the last thing I needed to be dealing with. I now had pools of vomit to clean up and my guests would be here soon. Could things have got any worse, I wondered. I escorted my dog into the garden, cleared up the vomit, washed my hands and continued to prepare the lunch. Before long, both my guests had arrived, but I noticed that Althea was a little flustered. Are you all right? I asked her. Your face is as white as a sheet. As I was driving up your drive, I, I think I might have hit a deer. It just ran out in front of my car, just like that. It gave me the fright of my life. Is it dead? Oh, I hope not, she said. It seemed to run off into the thicket, so I imagine the poor thing must have made it. Well, there you are, I said. I'm sure the animal's going to be fine. If he's not, it's hardly your fault. You should see in West Virginia, there are lots of near misses with deers, suddenly bolting into the road. It all happens all the time there, so don't worry about it. My kitchen was open plan, and so while I cooked, I could engage with my guests. They were both happily sitting on the settee, drinking large glasses of white wine, when my three-year-old girl came waddling into the kitchen. Hello there, Dotty, said my friend, cooing with delight to see my little girl. Sonia, she said, she's growing up so fast. Too quickly, I agreed. I watched in horror as Dotty produced the performance of a lifetime. She rolled down her pants and proceeded to pee in the middle of the floor in front of my guests. They sat there in horror, watching Dotty flood the floor with streams of pee. Dotty pulled up her pants and then waddled away just like a duck. My guests keeled over with laughter, but I was once again left clearing up still more pools of water. Was this day going to get any more worse, I wondered. Whereabouts did you hit the deer? Althea asked my friend, peering outside the kitchen window that overlooked the long driveway. It was over there, said Althea around there where the bear is, can you see? Whew, that bear is huge, she said, peering out of the window curiously. I'd never seen one quite that large. Let's see, I said, walking over to the window. The plumber was telling me I had a big bear on the property, but we rarely get bears here. Let's see, where did you say the bear was? Althea pointed and I reached for my binoculars to get a close view of the creature. That's not a bear, I said. Look, it's standing on two feet and its arms are way too long to be a bear's. And see, it also has hands. No, it doesn't have paws. Bears have paws. We watched in su stunned silence as the bear, su in stunned silence as the bear-like creature stood up. He was about eight foot tall and he had a strange cone-shaped head, virtually no neck to speak of, and a very generous sized torso that tapered down to a pair of thick, strong legs. What is he, I said in horror. The creature's covered with hair just like a bear, but it's something else. But the question is, what is it? What's he doing? asked Althea. Oh my word, I must have killed that deer. The one that I knocked over when I drove up your drive. Look, that creature's got it. He's slinging it over his shoulder. 
The poor thing must have died moments after I hit him. Now I really do feel bad. I hate killing anything. Sure enough, the creature was carrying the deer over his shoulders. And then the strangest thing happened. He looked up in our direction, almost as if he had felt us looking at him. Then he turned away and walked into the forest in large strides, and his movements were so graceful. Did you see that? said Althea. I think he sensed we were looking at him. Did you see how human his face was? The face indeed did look human. It was long, the nose appeared to be big, the skin looked weathered and worn, which you would expect if you got exposure from the elements. So there was no telling how old the creature was. Did you see how strong he was? said Leanne. He lifted that deer up as if it was nothing. Of course, I said suddenly. It's a Bigfoot. It's a Bigfoot. That's what it is. Althea was so excited. She started to tremble and dial her husband Anthon immediately and put the phone on loudspeaker so we could all hear the conversation. Anthon, guess what? Anton, guess what? You're never going to believe this in a million years. What's up? came Anton's voice. We've only just seen a real live Bigfoot. Aren't you supposed to be having lunch with Sonia? I am at Sonia's. We saw the Bigfoot in her field right here at Sonia's place, right from the kitchen window. You must have been seeing something else, babe. No, it was a Bigfoot. I saw his cone face and its long arms, and this creature had hands. It was probably a bear, said Anton. No, it wasn't, Anton. Why don't you believe me? Why aren't you listening? When I say I saw a Bigfoot, why don't you believe me that I saw a Bigfoot? Because, babe, they don't exist. Now don't go talking about this stuff at work. Your friends will think you're cuckoo. So you don't believe me then? I believe you think you saw a Bigfoot. That's what I believe. But I believe you didn't see one. Althea switched off her mobile and looked sullen. Why is it so hard to believe that we saw a Bigfoot? Why won't Anton believe me? Shall I see if Jake believes us, said Leanne, dialing Jake's number. Jake was Leanne's husband. Guess what, Jakes? I've just seen a real live Bigfoot in Sonia's garden. Jake roared with laughter. <laughs> You're funny, little muffin, he teased. You almost had me going there. For a moment I believed you. So you do not believe I saw a Bigfoot? Someone's playing tricks on you, said Jake. It probably was a man in a ghillie suit if you saw a Bigfoot creature. Someone's just pranking you. Bye, Jake, she said. Oh! But Muffin came Jake's voice fading into the distance as he was cut off by a frustrated-looking Leanne. Stuff him, she scolded. No one believes us. This will have to be our secret, because if we tell people what we've seen, they'll just ridicule us. Come on, I said, changing the sub subject. Let's have some pasta. Are you guys not hungry? Famish, laughed Leanne. I could eat a horse. I put my oven gloves on and opened the oven door and retrieved the hot pasta dish from the oven. It was piping hot, just what we needed, I thought. Suddenly I went flying into the air as I tripped over my golden retriever who had parked himself in the middle of the floor and my pasta went flying everywhere and some of it was even hanging off the walls. Are you all right? asked my friends who were trying to suppress their amusement and then they couldn't hold it any in anymore. They just roared with laughter. Let's order pizza, I said. I've had just a, as much as I can take for one day. Anyone fancy cleaning this mess, I teased, knowing full well that I had another date with my mop. The pizza man arrived at our door with all our orders wrapped up in separate pizza boxes. He was greeted by my overexcited golden retriever who was wagging his tail furiously and carrying two pieces of material in his mouth. He thumped his tail on the ground and dropped the material on the pizza man's shoes. It was a couple of pairs of my dirty knickers from the laundry basket. I was flushing with embarrassment and the pizza man looked mortified by his contaminated shoes. Who is having the Hawaiian pizza? he asked. That'll be me, said Leanne. Once he had given us our pizzas, he fled out of the house as fast as he could. Did you see his face? laughed Leanne. It was priceless. He looked so horrified. So that was my Bigfoot encounter, a disastrous day, when anything that could have gone wrong did. I got a couple of texts from my friends saying that they had not laughed so much in ages and seeing that Bigfoot was the cherry on the cake. When my husband returned home, 
and asked me how my day went. All I could say to him was, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. I hope you enjoyed my story. Anyone who's a dog walker is going to identify with this story. So let's get started. Dear Sarah, my name is Kathy, and I'm writing to tell you and your listeners about my Bigfoot experience, which happened to me at my home in Idaho. I live on my own in a tiny cabin on 20 acres of land with two creeks, Lightning and Cascade, running both through my property. I am close to Bee Top Mountain and Scotsman's Peak, and a few miles from Clark Ford Country Road. Anyway, where I live does seem very remote, but it's beautiful here, and I simply adore living in this part of the world because it is teeming with wildlife, and there's some great fishing spots and beautiful hike hiking trails around here. I have a large white mountain dog called Paffin, and every day I take him for walks, either along the creek or one of the hiking trails. One day I was walking Puffin on Lightning Creek, when I saw the silhouette of what I thought was a man in the water, but as I got closer to the creature, I thought it was a bear. Puffin and I hid behind a rocky ridge because we did not want the creature to see us. Puffin was growling and his ears were back and he was trembling. He really seemed frightened, which surprised me because he's always been a confident dog. Suddenly I heard whistling and I realized the creature in the water was the one that was whistling. So it couldn't have been a bear, because bears don't whistle. The whistling went on for some time while the creature just stood in the water. I honestly do not know what he was doing, because he just stood there. After a few seconds I heard a splash, and I looked up and the creature had a large catfish in his hands. When I saw the hands of this creature, I realised it did not have paws, but human-like hands. Then I saw the creature and he was striding out of the water on a pair of enormous large muscular thighs. He was swinging his arms as he walked and they were so long, long that they hung beyond his knees. As the creature stood up I realised how tall and how big he was. I believe he was seven foot tall and his chest and arms were enormous. He would definitely make those huge bodybuilders look small. I watched him killing the wiggling catfish by thumping it with a stone on the ground and then he sat on a rock, tore the fish in half and just ate it while his eyes darted from left to right as if he was checking that no one was coming down the path. My dog was still growling as I watched this creature and he made a snapping sound on a twig. In that second the creature looked up in our direction and sniffed the air and then he bolted in six foot strides into the undergrowth. His senses were amazing, I thought, because he heard the twig snap, and I think he detected our body sense, and that was enough to make him flee. When I got home, I immediately went online to see what the creature was that I had seen, and discovered it was a Bigfoot. On that occasion, I'd never got to see his facial details, but he did have the typical cone-shaped head, and virtually no neck. I do remember that. The next day, my friend Pam phoned me, and asked me if she could join me for some fishing at the creek and I thought it was a good idea. I did not tell her about my Bigfoot encounter the previous day. When she arrived at my cabin, we had coffee and went for a brisk walk along the trail with our dogs. She had brought Percy along with her. He is a cross between a Rottweiler and a Black Lab, and is a highly intelligent animal. He and Puffin just love playing together, and they love swimming and chasing rabbits. As we were walking, Percy got very excited and started barking at a particular spot under a tree. As we got closer, we found a strange nest made out of grasses and twigs, and there were some carcasses in this nest. This is a nest of some kind of predator, said my friend. But what? That's the question. It smells really rank. It reminds me of rotten garbage, I said. No worse than that, she said, like roadkill that's rotting and days old. Puffin, my dog, was burying his nose in the nest, and he grabbed something in his mouth and scurried away with it quickly with Percy running behind him. Both dogs were wagging their tails viciously. Puffin, I called, come here, give it back. Puffin, come here, give it back. Drop it, drop it, drop it now. Puffin was in no mood to listen. Whatever he had in his mouth, he was not going to relent of it. Finally, I managed to get Puffin to drop what was in his mouth, and he surrendered it, but it was with a lot of persuasion. Finally, with a great deal of reluctance, he dropped the furry, bedraggled mass on the ground at my feet. But before I had a chance to see what it was, Percy now had it in his mouth, and he was running 
off with it with a look of total exaltation on his face. Oh no, I groaned, not again. Percy, we called. Percy, come back. Percy, Percy, drop it, drop it, drop it now. Percy. Percy, we called, but he had galloped away like a horse. He did not want to let go of the prize he was carrying in his mouth, and he was even being more resistant than Puffin had ever been. Finally, we caught up with him after some brisk walking, and there he was lying on the ground behind a bush of some kind. He was chewing a coyote head, which he was clearly enjoying. We saw that he had the bone in his mouth and was tearing off the flesh and eating it hungrily. That's disgusting, Percy, I said. Give it to me now. But her Percy was not listening. He let out a warning growl as he continued to chew at the furry head with his long black paw holding it firmly in place. Suddenly we could hear the sound of a heavy bipedal creature walking towards us very quickly and rushing through the undergrowth like a steam engine on full throttle. The next thing I knew was that Percy was yelping and doing a somersault in the air. It was then that we saw him and he growled like a savage. It was a Sasquatch that I had seen from the day before and he was furious and unforgiving. He had hurled Percy into the air and had reached out to retrieve his coyote head from the terrified dog who was now hiding behind my legs and trembling with fear. The Sasquatch regarded us briefly through his brown eyes, then looked at Percy and growled at him directly as if to say, This is my coyote head and not yours. He gave Pam and I another glance and then in about three long strides was gone. It all happened so fast that Pam and I were too shocked to even be afraid. After the Sasquatch had left, we could smell the rotting odour we had smelt in the, at the nest, only this time it was a thousand times worse. Pam rushed over to the bush and hurled out the contents of her stomach. It's that smell, shits, she said. It's just made me want to vomit. What, what the hell was that creature, she said. I've never seen anything like it before. The face and hands were almost human. It's a Bigfoot, I said. I saw him yesterday. You knew that creature was out there and you did not think to tell me, said t she said, sounding furious. That thing could have killed us. Did you see the way the creature flung poor Percy in the air? I thought he was going to kill him. So did I, I admitted. Pam bent down on her knees and cradled the terrified dog in her arms. Poor, poor Percy. Poor, poor Percy, she said. I looked around for Puffin and guessed he'd run all the way home in fear. I knew my dog well enough to know he'd run off if he got scared. I was right, I was to learn later. If the creature ate a whole coyote... Why did he not just kill Percy, she asked. I mean, that coyote head could have not been much, much of a meal. It didn't have much meat on it, did it? I don't think it's about the meat, I reflected. I think the dog took something that was his and he was possessive about it. Wow, that's a good way of putting it. I wonder why he knew our dog had stolen the coyote head. I think these Bigfoots can hide and watch without us even seeing them, I said. Wow, said Pam. When we were examining the Bigfoot nest, I did have an uneasy feeling that I was being watched. I felt it too, I admitted, but I thought I was just being silly. After my Bigfoot experience, I did not give up my walks with Puffin. They always say that if you fall off a horse, you should get back on it. I was not going to allow fear to rob me of enjoying my property and my beautiful home. No chance. When I do venture out with my dogs, I do take a hunting rifle with me for precautions. A day after our encounter with a Bigfoot, I put a bunch of bananas, a bag of unsalted peanuts and some red apples into the nest as a way of saying sorry for taking your coyote head. I hope he understood that I was reaching out to him. Well, I have not seen the creature again or around my property, but I do sometimes hear wood knocks and whistling, so I guess he's still around. Hope you and your listeners enjoyed my story. So let's get started. The story comes from the Central Oregon Forests, all the way from Jennifer. Let's get started. I'm 67 years old and my Bigfoot experience happened two years ago on the 13th of June 2019. I drive a camper van that was converted into a beautiful portable home for me by a brilliant carpenter who specializes in personalizing camper vans. I drive a Fiat Ducato Maxi 2016 and I just travel all around North America. After my husband sadly died five years ago, I decided to buy my own camper van and spend the rest of my life traveling around and enjoying all the sights and sounds and meeting so many different people from different walks of life. 
My life has been transformed and changed forever. I never worry anymore about anything and I just go with the flow and see what life has to offer me every single day. I definitely recommend this lifestyle to any of your listeners who fancy an adventurous life full of surprises and so many learning experiences. Most of my time in the camper van has been wonderful. I have stayed in some beautiful places and every year I would always go to one of my favourite spots. Sadly, I can't tell you or your listeners where it is because a lady is entitled to have her secret places if you don't mind. I will tell you this, if it's situ it is situated in one of the beautiful forestal areas in central Oregon with cascading waterfalls, pools of moving water and wonderful animal life. I forgot to mention I have a beautiful miniature, miniature pincher called Maximilian. Strange name I know, I call him Maxi for short. Anyway, he's the best dog to have on the road because he just loves it. He is made for this kind of lifestyle and he's a real companion of mine. Anyway, let's, let's not get off topic. I'm sure your listeners want to hear all about my Bigfoot encounter. I remember it was very early in the morning when I woke up. I do not know why I woke up, but something roused me. Even Maxie was still fast asleep, snoring loudly. When I say morning, it was still dark outside the camper van, but you could tell that the sun would soon start to rise. I could hear the sound of what sounded like two people chattering in a foreign language at the river. I'm a little bit of a nosy Parker. I don't mind admitting it. I've never been a gossip though, but I always do want to know what's going on around me. And yes, I do want to see who the people were who are having a conversation together and why they were up so early. Maybe they'd gone for a dip or a stroll around the lake, who knows? I did wonder if there was another camper van nearby. Maybe someone had pulled up into the forest clearing last night and they were parked close to me. I sincerely hope not because I wanted this location greedily all to myself and I make no apologies for that. Anyway, I silently crept out of my camper van armed with my binoculars and I tiptoed to a nearby tree surrounded by some mossy overgrowth that clung to the branches providing a very decent hiding spot. I think it was a very old redwood tree. I focused my binoculars on the water and surveyed the lake and then I saw the back view of two dark figures playing in the water together. They were chasing each other in the water and throwing pebbles at each other, having so much fun. It looked extremely impractical because the, the weather was not cold and they were wearing these wool-like wool wetsuits. In other words, the wetsuits looked way too warm for them. Then in shock, I realized that these were not wetsuits, but it was dark hair that they were wearing. Could I be looking at bears? Surely not. I'd never see them play in a human way before. It was then that I saw the hugest, hugest creature that I have ever seen in my entire life as he walked through the undergrowth in thunderous huge strides. It seems as if the trees and the brushes buckled beneath him as he walked. He was an impressive looking specimen, not pretty, but very definitely powerful and strong. I felt like I was looking at an intimidating creature, like a huge lion or a tiger. He looked as if he was a thousand pounds in weight and he was at least ten and a half foot tall and his body was covered with fine grey hair. There was something about the way he moved that reminded me of the great apes that Diane Fossey worked with all those years ago. Only this creature was much more human looking than pure ape, but he was also not human. I guess he just reminded me of all that evolution stuff we learnt at school and those so-called pictures of early man, whether they're true or not, of course. This great big hefty creature rubbed his whole behind and his entire back against the trunk of the tree to give himself a really good scratch. Then he finally scratched his head rigorously with what looked like the edge of a piece of bark, which then he threw down the bank. He finally sat down on the bank side, watching his children playing and making pleasurable grunting sounds that sounded a bit like mm -hmm, 
As soon as they saw their father, the two juvenile Sasquatches came out of the water. I assume they were Sasquatches, because I guess by now that that is what they must have been. And they were shaking their coats like a shaggy dog would. Then all three of them got up and disappeared into the brush so fast. I reflected on what I had seen and even made a rough sketch, not that I'm any great artist by any means. I had drawn the cone-shaped head with no neck, wide shoulders, tapering to narrow hips, then tapering down to streamlined muscular legs. They all had deep-set eyes, a brow ridge, a leathery area of skin on their faces like rhino skin. Oh yes, and their noses were very big and flat. Anyway, after my experience, I felt very blessed, I really did, like a person would on a wildlife safari, watching a spectacular scene, like a lion taking down an impala or something like that. You would think I would be rattled and incredibly afraid, but I truly wasn't. I was in total awe about what I had just seen. Yet I knew that much as I would admire a hippo and a rhino or lion from afar, I definitely would not want to get up close and personal with any of them, nor with this creature. I would definitely say that they could all be very dangerous, including these Bigfoots. Luckily, I was not on the receiving end of his wrath. But to put it this way, I wonder how that big Bigfoot would have reacted should he have seen me. I hate to think. It was for that reason that after a quick breakfast, I made fast, hasty, hasty tracks out of the Orlando forest. I was not about to risk spending the night there. I knew if those Sasquatches were close by, they would discover my camper van, and who knows what they would do. I didn't want to be here to find out. I do love my camper van very much, and I don't want to risk anything happening to it because it is my life with my little minpin. I want to mention, I did not smell the horrible smells that people talk about and associate with Sasquatches, but then maybe I wasn't close enough. In the binoculars, I did notice that their coats were pretty tangled and matted, like they really needed a good brush, and certainly a trip to the beauty parlour. Jokes aside, I do hope your listeners like my story. Much love to you and your listeners. And by the way, keep my details confidential with many, many thanks to you and love to your listeners. Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful story. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. Thank you for listening to my Omnibus and I really do hope you enjoyed it because that's the whole idea about it is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time, goodbye and good night.